And we're delighted to have one of the ec economic gods uh, here uh, with us, uh, one who actually is on the side of the humans. Um, <laughs> for, for much of his career, Richard Thaler has tried to humanize uh, economic theory, to take traditional economic models, which assume that people behave rationally, uh, and inject them with more realistic considerations of how we, uh, how we actually behave. Uh, he's one of the fathers of the field of what's called behavioral economics, which essentially is economics infused with psychology and other uh, social sciences. This is supposed to make economic models predict things more accurately. At least it makes economics more fun and interesting, as Richard explains at the start of his new book, Misbehaving. The book uh, basically tells the story of Richard's tr struggles to promote behavioral economics in the face of strenuous and at times comical resistance from uh, traditional rationalists. Initially, his research and arguments were dismissed uh, by some as, as trivial, and he was regarded as a, as a bit of a crank. Uh, but he kept making his case as he moved from the University of Rochester to Cornell, ending up uh, 20 years ago on Chicago's business school faculty. One sign of how accepted he and his reasoning have become is that this year he's serving as president of the American Economic Association. Uh, his last book, Nudge, co-written with uh, Cass Sunstein of Harvard Law uh, about how to make better decisions by better understanding how people think, turned into a bestseller um, sh um, not too long after it came out, uh, seven years ago. Uh, his new book is written with similar clarity and insight and lots of humor. A uh, New York Times review the other day called it, quote, both engrossing and highly relevant. Uh, Richard will be here in conversation with David Leonhardt, an award-winning New York Times journalist uh, who used to write the paper's uh, economic scene column and serve for a time as Washington bureau chief. Uh, he is now managing editor of The Upshot, a Times website that focuses on politics, policy, and economics. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Richard Thaler and David Leonhardt. Thank you. Thank you for that nice introduction. As a long time, is this on? Are we good? Uh, as a long time customer of the store, it's a thrill to be sitting up here for me. And it's a thrill to be sitting here with Richard. Um, so uh, we're going to talk for a while and then we're going to open it up to all of you. Uh, I met Richard uh, in January of 2004 at the annual uh, American Economics Association convention in San Diego. Uh, I had read many of his papers and so emailed him and asked him if he'd sit down and, and help tutor me. And we were sitting in the lobby of a hotel in San Diego in January. And after about 10 minutes of talking, uh, he said, this is crazy. Why are we sitting down here when there's a playoff game on in my room? Uh, and we went upstairs and watched the Titans-Ravens game uh, and maybe <laughs> talked about economics. Uh, uh, there are a lot of commercials. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it wasn't on TV, so yeah, we had if, you've, if you've read the book, you know that one of the great images in the book uh, is the bowl of cashews. Uh, that standard economic theory would say that you are never worse off to have a bowl of cashews in front of you because if you want to eat it, you can eat it, and if you don't, you don't need to. Um, and what you realized is actually you are better off by moving the cashews. And so our bowl of cashews tonight is sports. Um, uh, left to our own devices, we might talk about it all night. I'm guessing that this is not an audience exclusively of sports fans. So we have committed to not talking about sports unless we get a question about it, um, and we can talk about sports later. Um, I want to start, and so you can now hold us to that. I want to start by reading one line from the book, um, which is about Thomas Kuhn, who wrote about uh, the model for scientific revolutions. And what he wrote about is, discovery commences with the awareness of anomaly, i.e. with the recognition that nature has somehow violated the paradigm-induced expectations that govern normal science. And then you go on to write, an important aspect of Thomas Kuhn's model of scientific revolutions is that paradigms change only once experts believe that there are a large number of anomalies that are not explained by the current paradigm. The paradigm in economics has changed. You've been at the center of that over the last 30 years. So let's go back to the list that you started drawing up. Tell us a little bit what this list was um, and the role that it ultimately played in changing the paradigm for how economics works. So, um, this is on? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. yeah. So, okay. Um, well, the uh, if Newton had his apple, I had my bowl of cashews, <laughs> and um, so that 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 evening when I was entertaining my fellow graduate students and we were devouring a bowl of cashews and I got the brilliant idea of taking the bowl and hiding it in the kitchen after eating a few on the way toward the kitchen. Uh, and then we came back and it, since we were economics graduate students, immediately started analyzing what had just happened. Uh, I illustrating a point that I think we made a nudge, which is a good rule of thumb is if you have more than half the guests at a dinner party from the economics department, the conversation will be boring. <laughs> so um, we, w somebody got out a napkin and we had a decision tree and uh, as David said, uh, we all knew that uh, we were happy I had removed the cashews and that that was impossible because it's not possible to make someone better off by removing an option. And I thought that was interesting. And then I was working on my doctoral dissertation uh, supervised by a very well-regarded uh, economist, Sherwin Rosen, also served as the president of the American Economic Association. He actually died the year he was president of the American Economics <laughs> Association, so uh, crossing, crossing my fingers. Um, and I must say, Sherwin was an extremely traditional economist. Um, and uh, he, he never really thought much of what I was up to. Um, but uh, the, the project I was working on for my thesis was on uh, the value of a human life, uh, which is a practical problem all governments have to deal with. So we can make things safer. How much should we be willing to pay to make things safer? We don't have infinite amounts of money. Um, we can spend money on other things. So the exercise was just an econometrics exercise uh, estimating how much you had to pay people to take risky jobs. But as a distraction from f writing Fortran code uh, and putting punch cards into, <laughs> uh, into a computer, I decided it would be interesting just to ask people the relevant question. So I posed the following question. Suppose by attending the event tonight, you've been exposed to a rare fatal disease and there's a one in a thousand chance you're gonna die a quick and painless death next week. How much would you pay for an antidote? That's question one. You can think of your answer. Qu question two, uh, question two is um, the hospital at Georgetown is running experiments on this very disease. They need su subjects who are willing to just walk into a room and expose themselves to a one in a thousand chance of dying a quick and painless death next week. How much would you have to be paid to participate in that experiment? And the answers I got were, to an economist, shocking. The typical willingness to pay uh, to get the cure was, say, a few thousand dollars. This was a long time ago. This was more than 40 years ago. Um, but the amount people demanded to take that risk, many people would say they wouldn't do it at any price. I don't quite believe them, but that's what they would say. But the ones that would give an answer it was typically two or three orders of magnitude larger. Now, economic theory says that uh, those answers have to be approximately the same. So I went and told Sherwin about this result that I got. 
And he said, go back to running regressions. This is, <laughs> this is a waste of time. Uh, but I started a list that, that David referred to. And the cashews was there. And this was there. And there were other examples, like a friend of mine and I got tickets to a basketball game in Buffalo. We were in Rochester. Is this the Buffalo Braves? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, well, we've already. Violated. You know, yeah, you're you're you're, you're misbehaving, David. Um, so, uh, uh, not to, not not shockingly, there was a snowstorm, and um, uh, the weather was very bad, and we decided to skip the game. But I, I had been given these tickets, and my friend Jeffrey, who I was going to go with, said. So no no it would be crazy to go for these game to this game. But we, if we had paid for those tickets, we'd be going. Now this is also misbehaving if you're an economist because one of the first things you learn is to ignore sunk costs. How much you paid for the tickets is irrelevant. You should go to the game if the marginal utility of going to the game exceeds the cost of going which was just driving there and back. How, regardless of how much we paid. So that was, these were the kinds of things that were on my list. And uh, for a long time, that was all there was. It was a list. So why does this matter outside of academia? Economists were wrong about lots of stuff for a long time. Several, a combination of psychologists and economists like you pointed this out. Some of them have come to accept it. Some of them haven't. But why should the rest of us care if economists had a lot of assumptions that were kind of silly? If we already knew that those assumptions were right. kind of silly? Well, we should care because economists have a monopoly on advising governments about virtually all important public policy problems. Uh, certainly, they have a monopoly among social scientists. Now, e economics teaches us that monopoly is bad. Uh, but uh, economists don't practice what they preach. Um, and so, uh, I you know, and th there's really, it's not like there's somebody else ready to step in, right? So w we wouldn't want to replace Janet Yellen with a psychologist or a sociologist um, or a mathematician. Um, Right? So, so there, there's a lot of what economists do that's vitally important. And so it's vitally important that they have the right models of what people do because they act on them. So when Alan Greenspan was the chairman of the Fed, he was a believer in the efficient market hypothesis, um, one aspect of which is Asset prices are correct. And so during the tech bubble, he said, Bob Schiller, one of my co-conspirators and uh, my president-elect, he will be the next president of the AEA, where, as I say in the end of the book, the inmates are taking over the asylum. Um, uh, Bob Schiller and John Campbell went and gave a speech at the Fed and say, warning that stock prices were getting too high. This was 1996. And that's what led Greenspan to give his famous speech using the phrase irrational exuberance, which Bob then took back as the title of his best-selling book. But uh, and then, remember, Greenspan gave a speech using that phrase in typical Greenspanese, meaning completely indecipherable. <laughs> and uh, that, the, those, that, that phrase appears in a sentence that says, how would we know if prices were being affected by irrational exuberance? And then he answers, we wouldn't. And uh, basically, just assumed it couldn't happen and that there was nothing for him to do. And uh, maybe there wasn't anything to do. And, and 
and although that bubble was costly, it wasn't nearly as costly as the subsequent real estate bubble. Uh, and uh, the reason that one was more costly was it was accompanied by more leverage. And, uh, and again, many policymakers weren't worried enough. Again, Schiller was their wor warning. Um, but uh, people thought, no, no, prices have to be right, and so there's nothing to worry about. So uh, it's very dangerous if policymakers think things can't happen, especially when they keep happening. Two footnotes about Bob Schiller uh, and that story. Bob's married to a psychologist, which is probably right. not a, a clinical psychologist. Yes, yeah. but nonetheless. Yes, right. <laughs> and when he was, I believe he was driving to work and he heard that speech from Greenspan. I think Greenspan may have given that speech in Japan. There was something funny. In any event, Bob was driving to or from work and heard the speech and thought to himself, oh my goodness, Greenspan just said something as a result of uh, what I told him yesterday and came home and told his wife. And she said, Bob, you're having delusions of grandeur. <laughs> <laughs> It, there, there's a part. There's a part of your book that that or several parts that make me think. Really, what you and your fellow misbehaviors are doing is trying to reclaim economics for the way it it, it once was and how it should be. And I wonder if you talk a little bit about both Adam Smith, who kind of has a, a, a wrong reputation, and Keynes um, uh, for him. Yeah. So uh, David's right that. Basically, until about 1940, economics was behavioral. And uh, in particular, Adam Smith was a great behavioral economist. People think about him as correctly as the father of modern economics, but wrongly, they think about him as somebody who completely believed in uh, laissez-faire and um, and a uh, rational economic man. Before he wrote The Wealth of Nations, he wrote another book called The Theory of Moral Sentiments, in which he talks about passions and controlling our passions, and talked about we have an impartial spectator that is helping us control our passions. And the famous phrase, the invisible hand, appears exactly once in The Wealth of Nations, and it appears in a sentence that's extraordinarily weak. May, yeah, yeah you it. It, 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 why don't you get it? Uh, uh, we'll come back to that because it, it, it's extraordinarily weak. And so we'll go back to, to Smith and then let's get to Keynes who's writing in 1936. No one reads Keynes anymore. Um, and if you mention Keynes, you think deficit spending. That's the... Uh, that that's the only thing people think about when they think about gains. He, he was also a great behavioral economist. And it, uh, particularly, I would say he was the inventor of the field of behavioral finance. Buy a copy of the general theory after you buy misbehaving tonight. <laughs> um, you prob there was probably only one here at most. So I'm not too worried. Uh, and uh, read chapter 12, or actually, you don't even don't have to buy it. Just go read that chapter. Um, and he has this famous passage where he talks about his view of the stock market as like a beauty contest. And the beauty contest he's referring to is a somewhat now politically incorrect exercise. They would have... Uh, posters with the pictures of a hundred attractive young ladies and the contestants in the contest, presumably all of whom were men, would guess which six would be judged the prettiest in a popular vote. And Keynes says, this contest is like investing in the stock market. And he says, the, what is the point of the, in this contest? It's not to s see which you think are the prettiest, or even which others will think the prettiest. You have to think what others will think others will think 
others will think are the prettiest. And as he says, there are people who take this to fifth or sixth levels. And he says, that's what investing in the stock market is about. That's exactly right. Think about, uh, think about value investing. What are value investors trying to do? They're trying to buy cheap stocks. Is that a good strategy? Only if they get less cheap. <laughs> and only if they get less cheap soon. Because Keynes also famously said, in the long run, we're all dead. <laughs> and, and if you're a portfolio manager, the long run is about two years. So, so, so OK, we're now in 1936. That's when Keynes wrote the general theory. And uh, Irving Fisher uh, was writing around that time, also a behavioral guy. Then comes along Paul Samuelson. And uh, you have the Smith quote. I do. Why don't you read it? Okay. It starts, uh, it goes Thaler and then into Smith. Uh, I'll, I'll note the transition. <laughs> Oddly, the most well known phrase in the book, the vaunted invisible hand, appears only once treated with a mere flick by Smith. He notes that by pursuing personal profits, the typical businessman is, quote, led by an invisible hand to promote an end which was no part of his intention. Nor is it always the worse for the society that it was no part of it, end quote. Right, nor is it always the worse for society. That's his strong claim. Right? I mean, that's pretty weak. Right? It t might turn out okay sometimes. Um, and in entire intellectual enterprises are built around the notion of an invisible hand, which might sometimes not turn out too badly. Right? That's the author of this, that's the strongest claim he's willing to make. So, so now. Paul Samuelson comes along, uh, and he's the first of, of many economists, but sort of the first and greatest at uh, mathematizing uh, economics. And uh, Samuelson's PhD thesis uh, is called The Foundations of Economic Analysis. Pretty. You know, talk about chutzpah. Yes. And he's, uh, he's Larry Summers' uncle? He's is that right? He, I think he is. He, Larry Summers has two uncles who are arguably the greatest economists of the 20th century. <laughs> One is Paul Samuelson, the other is Ken Arrow. Okay. Good genes. <laughs> so, um, so... Yeah, so um, Samuelson comes along and, as his PhD thesis, redoes all of economics with proper mathematical rigor. And that starts economics down a path in which, if you're going to be serious about economics, you have to do it formally. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, precision is good. Economists, like humans, uh, are boundedly rational, to use Herb Simon's phrase. And if you're going to solve a mathematical problem, the easiest one to solve is to optimize. Right? If, if you want to compute what's the fastest or the shortest distance between here and the front door, a straight line is going to win. And it's pretty easy to compute that. If you want to compute what path people will take as they go from here to the cash register, who knows? It's going to be influenced by, you know, distractions like interesting books along the way. So because optimization problems are pretty easy to solve, anybody who's had a high school calculus class knows you take the first derivative, set it equal to zero, solve, right? So 
economists all of a sudden, well, not all of a sudden, but adopted this method of assuming people optimize because they knew how to solve optimization problems. And then I would argue, there, uh, uh, there's not, I'm so far, I'm not being critical at all. I'm just describing what happened. I think uh, where I would get critical is that a kind of norm evolved, which is that, suppose I write down a model of people optimizing, and then David comes along who knows more math than me. And he writes down a model of people being smarter than the ones in my model. Then the norm was his model's better than my model. And so over a period of about 40 or 50 years, the agents in economic models kept getting smarter and smarter. We didn't. <laughs> You know, evolution doesn't work that way. It's pretty slow. So uh, I think economics lost its way. It was behavioral, and then it got anti-behavioral. And that's the state of play that I came into in the 70s as a graduate student. So some of the ways in which we are human rather than econs um, I think are good for us. Right, I think it's. Yeah. I think right. Clearly, um, some of them are bad. Yeah, we're right? nicer. We're nicer. We're nicer than econs. And look, if it makes us happy to skip the game when we didn't pay for the tickets, and makes us happier to do it, if we're talking about a single game or a concert or whatever, yeah. maybe that's fine. But clearly, there are some of our irrationalities that are bad, that are harmful yeah. to us. Right, and there are all kinds of I think really interesting policy and macro questions that we can get into later. You folks may have questions about them. The, the really obvious ones are retirement savings, where your work has had a big influence on policy, but there are still a lot of gains we could do. There are other things like that. I actually want to go a little bit smaller with this question, um, not about policy, but to ask you to think a little bit about all of our lives, our relationships with our friends and our spouses, our partners, our parents, our children, the choices we make about what jobs to pursue, the choices we make about where to live. Um, what are the ways in which we all, uh, in day-to-day -day life, tend to misbehave in ways that if we could fix, if we could nudge ourselves, if we could do other things, would actually cause us to be happier people? It's a really interesting question. Um, I mean, there are so many ways. L let me think of a couple. What, one is, I, I think we often have very narrow goals. Um, so for example, when PhD students go on the job market, I would say over 95% accept the job at the most prestigious university that makes them an offer. Which probably goes for, for high school students, too. Now, that can't be right, right? The prestige of the university you work for is one thing that goes into your utility function. Maybe the weather might be another one. Maybe the city that you're living in might be another one. Maybe you like living in New York better than uh, New Haven. And so you'd be happier living in the village at NYU than in New Haven at Yale. But virtually no one turns down a job at Yale to take a job at NYU. It should happen some of the time. Uh, I think we, <laughs> I once tried to convince David not to become the Washington bureau chief. Um, I, I failed. Um, but I was worried that uh, you were falling into that kind of trap. It was a promotion of some sort, uh, or at least it could be viewed as a promotion. He, he, you know, he was merely the chief economics correspondent for the most important newspaper in the country, and now he was be gonna become a manager. 
At least that's the way I would put it to him. <laughs> <laughs> you really? You want to do that? So, uh, so I, th I think that we, there are lots of traps we can fall into. Here, let, let me give you... Uh, let me give you one ru rule I tell my students. Uh, this is a, uh, I tell them this after uh, pointing out that, you know, these are mostly students in their 20s. Many of them are in the process of thinking about getting married. And I ask them, you know, is that a rational act given the 50% divorce rate? But then I say, all right, here's a rule that might help. And it's, it comes from Al Roth. Uh, I don't know whether I've ever told you this. I call it Roth's Rule because I learned it from Al, who has a new book coming out soon, by the way. Um, it's not as funny as mine. Um, so here's Roth's Rule. You can't be happier than your spouse. <laughs> this is extremely deep and important. For the uh, mathematicians, uh, the dynamic version of this rule is the less happy, the more miserable of the couple will pull the other one down to his or her level of misery. And so the implication of that is if you're the temporarily happier one, you, I hope you're writing this down. Yeah, 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 no, yeah. No, <laughs> <laughs> so if, if you're the one that's fleetingly happier, um, the, the only way you can maintain that is to make your spouse happier. And so that's, that's my advice to reduce the divorce rate in this crowd. So... One more thing before we get to questions. Um, uh, Britain, where we just had yeah. an election. Yeah. Uh, you uh, have advised the current president of the United States back when he was a colleague of yours yes. and when he was president. And as on the campaign, I, I think your sensibilities generally are on the more progressive half of the spectrum. Um, uh, you also have advised the current Tory government in England. And uh, I'd be interested in your thoughts about any of that, but in particular, what it makes you think about, about what a right-leaning party looks like that is, on the one hand, actually right-leaning, right? It's not just the right-leaning party that left-leaning people would like to see, but is different from the current Republican Party. Well, first of all, Frankly, I, in five years of working with the Cameron government, I've been unable to detect any important difference between David Cameron's views and Barack Obama's views. Uh, I think George Osborne, the uh, exchequer, um, has... Uh, different views than Obama's economic advisors. So they practiced some austerity. They talked a better austerity game than they practiced, fortunately, in my view. I think there's been way too much austerity both there and here. Uh, I think the fact that we have not over the last seven years when we could borrow at negative interest rates and had vast unemployed resources, not just labor, but factories and construction equipment. The fact that we haven't been rebuilding America during the last seven years, I think, is the greatest economic mistake um, since the Great Depression. And, of course, we didn't make that particular mistake in the Great Depression. The, the mistakes there were more on the uh, monetary policy. Uh, Roosevelt did start building stuff, but we're going to see bridges falling down left and right in this country, and it's going to cost us a lot more to fix them than it would have over the last seven years. So, I, I mean, there is that difference, but otherwise, you know, um, you know, David Cameron 
uh, came out in favor of gay marriage before Barack Obama did. So, um, you know, it, it's not clear that uh, the the conservative, the, the right-wing party in the UK is much to the right of a uh, centrist Democrat. Uh, I think he's to the right of Elizabeth Warren, but probably <laughs> probably not to the right of Hillary Clinton. Okay. Um, yeah. Good. Uh, two quick things before I open up to you all. Uh, one, uh, just to echo our host, please keep questions short and keep them questions. Um, and two, um, I'm going to embarrass Richard for a minute, which is I have been talking to him, as I said, for 10 years. Uh, I knows, had previously heard some of the stories in the book. I loved rehearing them. They had details I didn't know. I laughed many times. Uh, this is an unabashed advertisement. You should buy this book. Buy it tonight. Buy it on a Kindle. You'll learn a ton, and you will love it. Um, Thank you. You're welcome. I'll pay you later. <laughs> Uh, let's get to questions. Yes. No, so, no. Microphone. Oh, yeah, microphones. Great. Microphone. Sorry. Right here. Come okay. On up, sir. This is a very important question. I was at a panel at Brookings five years ago. I'm a physician. I was at a panel at Brookings five years ago uh, on um, employee benefits, and there was a panel on behavioral economics where, I don't think you were there, where some there. people said that humans are very bad at estimating risk. Uh, particularly risk far in the future, like medical risk, mm -hmm. how they're going to get sick. Um, first, do you think that's true? And second of all, if it is, do you think it makes sense to have great choices of different insurance plans? People know what they can afford, but assuming that they're not sick now, they really don't have a very good idea of how sick they might become. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, the, the in the spirit of this, I will try to also give brief answers, uh, although that's a very complicated question. So I think first, the answer to the first question is uh, no, people are not very good at, I mean, we're a country where a quarter of us are obese, uh, where many people still smoke, um, where most of us don't get enough exercise. So I mean, there's no doubt that people are not optimizing. An econ would weigh exactly the right amount, would never have to go on a diet because he already weighs the right amount. Um, he would be optimally chubby, um, <laughs> just like me. Um, now, a as far as choice in healthcare plans, I I'm not one who tends to think that one size fits all is uh, usually the best way of doing things. But I'm also someone who thinks that giving people a massive array of choices and no help is a bad idea. In Nudge, we made fun of the Medicare Part D uh, prescription drug program Correctly. And how hard it was to select the best plan. And what we suggested was, and this would be quite easy to do in that domain, and it's an embarrassment to me that we still haven't done it, is to default people into the plan that we guess would be best for you based on your past experience. When you're old like me, um, the drugs you take this year are highly correlated with the drugs you take last year, plus one. Uh, so it would be very easy in, in that domain. And uh, the state of Maine did that for a while, and then um, I think they got in trouble for doing that. We should be doing that. We're not. I, I don't know. And, and, and it's an embarrassment to me that we're not. Uh, we should be doing the same for Obamacare. We should be, uh, it, now, you know, there are, c certainly the advice that, that's available online for choosing the best plan in Obamacare is way better than what was available back then, but it's not as good as it should be. So that's, that's my answer. 
Oh. And I should I should make clear we have two microphones up here. Come on up if so. If yeah, get in line behind each yeah. one, and we'll do as many of these as we can. I collect books by economists signed by economists who disagree with them. So I have, for instance, Esther Navajit's book signed by Angus Deaton. <laughs> Whose book should I get to sign? Have you signed tonight? <laughs> yeah, I can't. Uh, I would say my golf buddy Gene Fama. Yeah, I was going to say that. Yeah. I mean Gary Becker died. Yeah. So, uh, and I, I will say, uh, let me say one other thing, which is, you know, I don't think that I've changed anybody's mind in 40 years. It, you know, there's a line, I'm sure it's a paraphrase from Max Planck that science marches on funeral by funeral. <laughs> and um, so it, it's not that I've convinced the people my age to change their stripes. It's that I've corrupted the youth. <laughs> and this was a very deliberate strategy. 20 years ago, we started having, through the Russell Sage Foundation, what, what we always refer to as summer camps, behavioral economic summer camps, where graduate students from around the world come for two weeks and learn behavioral economics. One of the students, at the first camp was David Leipzig, um, who now is one of the teachers at that camp. <laughs> I actually have a funny story about David Leipzig to share. David's it, it, it is also studied self-control, <clears throat> and um, in a in a formal way, and he's st studied uh, he, something that we now call present bias which is that if, if for something we want, we want it right now. And it's way better if we get it right now than a few months from now. The same, the, op, the same is true in the opposite direction for something we don't want to do, right? So, you know, cleaning out the attic, not today, but in a few months, yeah. So I have some nice news about David. He's going to, he may be making the same mistake you made. He's about to become chairman of the Harvard Economics Department, which makes me very proud. Uh, he's agreed to do that starting in November. <laughs> <laughs> and I, have a, where, I don't know where the questioner went, but uh, right here. I walked what, up here. what uh, book did you bring yeah. for Richard to sign? Oh. <laughs> uh, uh, oh, uh, I, we, I thought you were asking who you should No, get he was. I was flipping yeah. it. And, oh, and uh, yeah. What book? I guess it would be Fama's book. Well, he, he hasn't yeah. written a book in a yeah. long time. Right. So. Yeah. yeah. Um, just one last thing, and then I'll come to you. Uh, your story about corrupting the, the young generation of economists with these ideas that are actually accurate reminds me of the two adjectives to describe the opinions of people over 55 about same-sex marriage. One is opposed and two is irrelevant. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Professor, I'm a graduate of GSB, but I was going long before you got there, so I soaked up the mid-1970s environment with Gene, Fama, and Myron Scholes and Merton Miller. And after you joined the faculty, I kept thinking, I wonder what kind of conversations he has with Fama in the hallway. Uh, because back in those days, <coughs> we didn't use the word behavioral, but people would always come to Gene in class and try to, of course, trump Gene, which is not possible when he's up there and you're sitting down. And <coughs> I don't think we used the word behavioral at that point, but people would always come up with examples of why the market wasn't f efficient. <coughs> and one day, a student was saying, Thomas going through his dividends don't matter, uh, convolutions on the board. And the student says, wait a second, Professor Fama, I was just reading today in the Wall Street Journal that the current desires of investors are for dividends and not cap or, or capital, uh, dividends and not capital gains. So Fama says, Wall Street Journal, what the hell do they know about the current desires of investors? At least if it was Penthouse Magazine talking about the current desires of investors, you'd have some idea what desire they were talking about. <laughs> so, all right. I, I, Gene actually is a friend of mine. Uh, as I said, we're f frequent golf companions. Can he beat you uh, in tennis? Uh, we both used he. I could not beat him in tennis. Um, we both saw the writing on the wall um, about our tennis games and switched to golf. 
<laughs> because it has a long. This is rational expectations. Yeah. You can play that game longer. So uh, th I will tell you a quick story from the book about what happened when I arrived at the University of Chicago. About ten years ago. Twenty years ago. Yeah. So a reporter, not David, a reporter uh, first called Merton Miller. Mm -hmm. And asked him why and he, he was had part of the old guard, yeah. right? Yeah, he, he, one of and, the giants. Yeah, and you know, if he were still alive, you'd want Miller to sign my book. Yes, which he yes. wouldn't do. Yes, yes. and uh, so they asked Miller why he had not blocked my appointment. Now, this is a kind of impertinent question, <laughs> right? And especially since he was emeritus. Yes. And, uh, but Mert didn't mince words, and he said, uh, I didn't block Thaler's appointment because each generation has to make their own mistakes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, for a while I had a sign on my door, this generation's mistake. Yeah. <laughs> Gene, uh, with whom I've got, always gotten along very well, uh, he, he was asked the same question, and his reply was, uh, oh, we hired Thaler because we wanted him nearby where we could keep an eye on him. <laughs> yeah. So I think um, Gene actually, I, I'll tell you one last thing. I gave him a copy of the book last week. Did he sign it? I signed it to him. Yeah, no. I, and I wrote, uh, I do not think reading this book is consistent with rational utility <laughs> maximization. Um, <clears throat> but I got comments from him uh, last week. So I'll tell you about them later because yeah. they're about sports. Excellent. <laughs> Do we have someone else here? Yeah. Uh, is there questions? Or? Next question. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you had a very quick one. So you can yeah. have another. So uh, how would you have designed the seating allocation to not uh, uh, violate norms of fairness, but actually maximize utility for tonight? Uh, well, I guess I would have uh, done it um, like an airline. Um, we'd have first class seating up here. <laughs> and uh, But to justify that, they would be uh, c more comfortable seats. Uh, and then um, the problem is, of course, this is all free. So it's hard to know exactly what the pricing mechanism would have been. But uh, we would have had one, but we, we, um, we wouldn't auction them off. So. Yeah, uh, right here. Sorry. Um, Go ahead. We'll youth here. Yeah. Um, just curious, is it a rational idea to pursue an econ PhD this day and age with things changing so much the way tech is going out to devote <coughs> five years to pursue a knowledge in economics? when so much is changing right now in the job market? Uh, look, I think economics has never been better. And I'm, uh, I'm very optimistic about economics. And, you know, I say at the end of the book, my goal is, you know, it refers to the question that David asked me right at the beginning um, about, is, isn't this behavioral economics kind of a funny phrase? Why do we need behavioral? And um, uh, my goal is for behavioral economics to disappear and for economics to become as behavioral as it needs to be. Now, in some domains, it doesn't have to be very behavioral at all. Um, it, m much of what economics does is, is rightly studies the solution to optimization problems. If, if you want to figure out the best way to run a factory, Right? You want to optimize. So it's, it's, it, it's what we would call normative. If we're trying to describe how factories operate, we would need a different kind of model. And the most encouraging thing to me is some of the best young economists in the world are doing exactly that. And the, the, certainly the leading example of that would be Raj Chetty, who um, I think is unarguably uh, the most talented young economist in the world. He won the John Bates Clark Award, 
given to the best economist under 40. He won it at 34, which pissed off a lot of 35, 36, 37, 30, and especially 39 year olds. <laughs> yes. um, and last year, in my role as president elect of the AEA, one of my duties was to ask someone to give, there's a famous named lecture, the Ely Lecture. I asked Raj to do it. And uh, Raj has done fantastic work on inequality, which has been featured a lot in, uh, what's the name of your newspaper? The New York Times. Yeah, right, <laughs> uh, that one. Uh, using uh, some of the great graphics um, that the Times now features, thanks to, uh, what's it called? The Upshot. Yeah, Thank you. right. Um, and um, by the way, the graphs in my book were produced by one of David's um, crew. Anyway, uh, Raj, the lecture he chose to give, and you can read it, it's in the most recent version of the AER, and it's posted on Raj's website, so you don't have to worry about a paywall, um, unlike some things. Um, and um, he gave a lecture on uh, the sort, I don't remember exactly, you remember the title? It's something like uh, Behavioral Applications to Public Policy or something like that. So I don't think Raj would define himself as a behavioral economist. He would define himself as an empirical economist studying real world problems like inequality, uh, but he will do behavioral um, if it's appropriate. And uh, so I, I think there isn't a more, I can't imagine a more exciting time for studying economics. If you've seen any of the maps that we've produced at the Times on your odds of escaping poverty based on where you grow up, on how where you grow up affects you, that's all based on Raj's work. Chetty, Chetty. C-H-E-T-T-Y. Uh, Mr. Thaler, <clears throat> this is a long shot question. I guess I'm not expecting much from it, but I'm gonna try and take my two favorite fields of economics and collide them for a moment and ask you, in your many years, have you stumbled across any misbehaviors relating to intellectual property, uh, copyrights, patents, trademarks? The way that uh, traditional economists view that field and the way that the general populace actually reacts to it and uses that sort of thing. It's, it's quite funny. I mean, so my uh, short answer is no. Hmm. Um, the wisecrack answer, which I will only say if everyone in the room promises not to repeat it, is that I'm my uh, conversation partner in Seattle is Nathan Mirvold. Some people would say he's misbehaving in this domain, but uh, <laughs> but let's leave it at that. Last question. Yes, um, I'd like your thoughts about applying your thinking to the investment management business and the debate between active and passive management and to the extent that people are misbehaving, you know, what's the role of an active manager? And I'll actually just piggyback onto that and say, in some ways I think this is one of the most interesting tensions out there, which is I think many of the people who think along similar lines to you in the broadest sense would say, just put it in a mutual fund and never think about it again. And, and I think a lot of your work says it's maybe not quite that simple. Yeah, so I actually, I was, as part of this tour, I had the pleasure of being on Squawk Box at some ungodly hour of the mm -hmm. morning. And, um, and also on Yahoo Finance. And I, there, I told them that uh, the listeners would be better off watching ESPN. <laughs> uh, that it was... Uh, their, their investing would be better if they stuck to ESPN. So, um, look, I think, um, can you beat the market? Can you guys beat the market? I would say no. Um, is it possible to beat the market? I'm, I'm not an unbiased judge of that. I'm a principal in an active money management firm. Uh, called Fuller and Taylor. Um, we've been in business for more than 
25 years. So um, it, we're either lucky or know something. But what I would say is beating the market is hard. Uh, we've been able to do it, but not every year and not by a lot. And certainly putting all of your money into low-cost index funds where all of my retirement money is. Hmm? Uh, it's not that I don't invest in our funds, but they're not available at the University of Chicago. So all of my retirement money is with Vanguard mm -hmm. in low-cost funds. Yep. And you can't go wrong with that strategy. Yeah. Um, I think one of the best things that's happened in the re retirement domain, aside from automatic enrollment and Save More Tomorrow and the kind of behavioral changes that I've helped uh, introduce, is um, th uh, th these very sensible um, default investment funds, uh, like target date funds, especially if they have low fees, which they don't all have. But, but what they prevent is they prevent people from doing what comes naturally, which is buying high and selling low. Mm -hmm. in, in the crisis, 401k investors sold stocks the, in, in, in droves, net inflows into equity funds only became positive in 2013, by which time the market had doubled. I had to convince Cass not to sell off all of his stocks in 2008. <laughs> and um, so I, I, I think I convinced him. But uh, so, uh, yeah, you know, I think you can't go wrong by assuming you can't beat the market. I just want to end with three thank yous. Thank you to all of you for coming out. Thank you for this book and all the ideas. And thank you to the entire staff of Politics and Prose. We are enormously lucky to have this book.